Good evening, spooky minds of the interwebs. I'm Alexa, the resident ooky spooky girly, and welcome back to another installment of me yelling into the abyss about leaving Ouija boards alone. Nothing, and I mean nothing good, can come from them, and bad experiences will forever outnumber the good. Seriously, I can't say I've ever heard an actual good story, so let me know in the comments if you can prove me wrong. Otherwise, here are the top five Ouija board horror stories you pray don't happen to you. Number five, Patty Donovan. This is a tale from the investigative files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, my favorite paranormal investigators. Fifteen year old Patty Donovan came across the Ouija board and decided to use it to find a friend. From the first yes in response to her queries, she was hooked. She spent months falling in love with a spirit she believed to be in love with her, telling it specifics about her everyday life. After a year of telling all of her secrets to the board, Patty had become emotionally dependent on the spirit, asking it one night to reveal her future. During the very long session, it laid out a scenario of Patty's life for the next six years, providing specific details, right down to the date of birth of her first offspring, and the fact that she would have a total of three spawn by 1978, which is all information that would eventually prove correct. Being as dependent as she was on the evening of March 2nd, Patty now pleaded for the spirit to manifest. The next morning, Theodore Donovan found the spark plug wires pulled out, the rubber hoses unfastened, and the fan belt cut when he attempted to start his car. And not much later, Patty attempted to start her car, and it was discovered later that the internal engine had been completely disassembled. That week, other incidents of apparent vandalism occurred around the Donovan house. Foundation shrubs were yanked out of the ground, roots and all. On the roof, a six-foot cast iron pipe housing electrical wires was found bent at a 90-degree angle. On Friday, March 8th, Ted marked one flat on the kitchen calendar. And no sooner did Patty get her car back from the shop than one of her other tires lost air. The next day, being Saturday, her father made the same entry on the calendar, although this time it seemed the tire had been cut with a sharp implement. In the meantime, Patty could no longer raise her invisible boyfriend on the Ouija board. Night after night, she tried to communicate, but the planchette would simply slide over to goodbye. She had no idea her ethereal bow had actually manifested in the form of a supernatural vandal. Like come on, buddy goes completely silent and your house starts being targeted by hell demons and you don't pick up on it? By the second week of March, material damage to the house and cars had become so troublesome that Ted complained to the police, who assured him that they'd keep an eye on the property during night patrols. Later that second week, after work, Ted and his wife, Ellen, were sitting in the kitchen with their son, Brian, when all three heard something smash against a wall somewhere inside the house. Cautiously moving to investigate, they found a gaping 18-inch hole in the plasterboard wall in Brian's room. Just as upsetting was the fact that the jagged edges of the plasterboard were pointing inwards, with the blow coming from inside the walls. Yeah, the evidence is already a mountain for me, but we still have plenty more to pick through. Listening in the dark that night, Ted heard the sound of a board being pried loose, but after checking the entire house thoroughly, found no loose boards. The house was further plagued by loud noises every night that only escalated in frequency and volume, along with further unexplainable damage to the walls. On April 1st, furniture began to levitate, with a 250-pound dresser flinging its contents while flying erratically. Rocks had also begun to rain from the sky, pelting only the Donovan house, which the police bore witness to. Ted eventually broke down at work and explained the horror of his home to his supervisor, who urged him to reach out to the Warrens. Ted instead tried moving his family into a hotel first, and the spirits followed the family there, destroying the room and making so much noise that the family was thrown out of the hotel and forced to return home. Finally contacting Ed and Lorraine, they arrived in Maine as quickly as they were able to, hiding the home in complete disarray. Lorraine said nothing, although at the time she sensed in the home the presence of entities so numerous and threatening that she had to fight with herself to keep from going back outside. After a lengthy tour of the house, Ed and Lorraine conducted an interview with the entire family, where Patty's history with the Ouija board was revealed. To that I say, about dang time. The Warrens then contacted the Catholic Church to begin the process for an exorcism, which that process sadly took a month to be granted. The family experienced many more unexplainable horrors during that time, but that alone could fill out a top five of its own, so let me know in the comments if you want that eventually. Number four, the first victim. The board's dark history begins with the strange death of the owner of the original trademark, American entrepreneur William Fold, in 1927. After acquiring the business from its former owner, a medium named Helen Peters, who sold it because of the serious damage it caused to her family, William built the company into a profitable business. Shortly thereafter, he began to experience his own family troubles that resulted in him cutting his brother out of the company in 1919, and just like my mother and I, they never spoke again. Eight years later, on February 24th, William was on the roof supervising the erection of a flagpole when a support suddenly snapped and he toppled off the building. He tried to break the fall by grabbing onto a windowsill, but the window closed and he fell to the ground, breaking several ribs. He should have survived, but the vehicle hit a bump on the way to hospital that sent a splint of cracked rib bone into his heart instantly. Now well then, 
What a coincidence. After his death, William's descendants took over the company. Catherine and William A. Fuld ran the company until the youngest brother, Hubert, became president in 1942. The Parker brothers acquired the company and all of its assets in 1966, and finally Hasbro took over Parker Brothers, and with it, the Ouija board in 1991. I have no issue with cursing out Hasbro. While they may be great at making board games that aren't cursed, and I'm sure they're profiting on the Yikes fandom that are the adult fans of My Little Pony, they really bungled the years that they held the Disney Princess doll rights, and that's something I'll never forgive them for. Number 3. A Long Term Buddy I'm using buddy pretty loosely here. This tale comes from Reddit user Madame Mim 20 which I'm hoping is a reference to the Sword in the Stone. During her junior year of high school, she went to a party where the host brought out a Ouija board, and she admitted that she was into paranormal stuff, but didn't know the dangers of, you know, one of those boards. Typical questions were asked, but her vision began to darken, even though the lights were on. The last question being the classic. How old will I be when I die? Everyone got traditional numbers, except for Mim. The planchette moved to zero, and then one, then zero, then one, continuously moving between those two numbers until someone just shook the board and said it was being stupid. At that point, she stopped playing, since it weirded her out, and I'm sensing two red flags so far. But I'll excuse one of them, since she didn't know the horrors at the time. Mim claims to have a decent ability to sense the unknown, and normally see, you know, beings or ghosts. This one showed up during one of her classes not even a few weeks later. If anyone's getting deja vu, this is reminding me of Patty Donovan as well, don't worry. At first, the ghost appeared like a comforting protector, until he wasn't. Weird things in Mim's home would happen, ranging from drawers opening, whispers, shadows, lights in places where they shouldn't be, and books moving on their own. And at night, it would be much, much worse. He would just stand in front of her door, and the fear would ooze out of him as his form would change. Mim had no doubt that he was downright evil, to which I say, no S-H-I-T, Sherlock. She dealt with all of this single-handedly until she moved in with her husband. So I'll give credit where credit is due for enduring that. Things escalated in the now duo's first home together, a small 400 square foot rental. Footsteps, breathing, and unknown whispers became the norm. At the time, her soon-to-be husband was a practicing Wiccan and had blessed most of the home, but forgot about the porch and outer walls, where they would hear scratches on the walls and knocking on the door and windows. Folks had seen her demonic attachment as a shadow and described him as tall and built like a brick house. Also that he felt just outright bad and would always go back into the room Mim was in. Her husband had tried to banish him out and, uh, yeah, it didn't go well. For context, her husband worked the closing shift at his place of employment and would get home at around 3.30am, which happens to be right in the middle of prime haunting hours. There was a road he would have to take that was very haunted as well, with a history of lots of accidents and right next to a good sized river. One night he got home looking extremely pale and sweating. Turned out that while driving on that specific road that night, his brakes failed and he couldn't stop. He was going about 100 kilometers an hour, and the wheel began to jerk out of his hands towards the river. He had to use all his strength to keep that car on the road because the wheel was just yanking so hard. To the shock and surprise of no one, the brakes were fine the next day, and uh, ditto for the wheel. This was the final straw, and the duo had a priest bless the entire house, and were eventually able to move out of the state and leave whatever it was behind. Number 2. Teenage hijinks. This tale comes from a gal named Jenny, and also dates back to, well, high school hijinks. She was at her friend's house for a fun summer weekend, and on the Sunday night, they decided to make themselves a Ouija board, taking all the precautions, using a piece of flat plywood, which was laminated with plastic on one side, and using an old glass, which could later be discarded. This was the first experience for both of the teens, and they assured each other that they were going to do it properly, you no know, being stupid and pushing the glass around to fool the other. They started off by saying a prayer before asking if there were any spirits present, trying to be specific about only wanting contact with peaceful and good energies and spirits. Here's the thing, you can't guarantee who is going to answer a Ouija board, and evil spirits are going to lie if they need to to deceive you. So while I commend the intent, I'm already sensing a yikes situation. The glass was moving very slowly at first, and they were unsure if it was working or not. The duo asked if there was somebody who wished to talk to them, and the glass moved slowly over to the yes marker. They asked the spirit, you know, if it was male or female, and it indicated that it was female. When asked to spell out its name, the glass first traveled to K, and then to a Y, and then to M, before ending on the center. Ergo was spelling out Kim. Jenny's friend went white, and it was obvious that he was freaked out. They then asked how she died, and the spirit spelled out car, which further scared Jenny's friend. Next, they asked what kind of car it was that Kim had died in, and it proceeded to spell out Reliant Robin. It was at this point that her friend told Jenny that his auntie was dead, her name was Kim, that she died in a car accident, and uh, yeah, she was driving a Reliant Robin. Next, they asked if the spirit had anything to tell them, but it indicated no, and then said goodbye. As much as I hate to crush spirits, pun not intended, I doubt that was actually his aunt. Probably just a demonic spirit playing an awful joke, which is something I wouldn't wish on anybody. So next they asked if there was any more spirits that wished to communicate with them. It suddenly got very cold in the room, and the hair was standing up on both teens' necks and legs. This spirit was more powerful, and the glass moved a lot faster. 
They asked if it was male or female, and it indicated that it was a male. Once again, following a formula, they asked for the spirit's name, and he said he was called Liam. Next, the duo asked for the spirit's age when he passed over, and he went to the 7, and then to the 0, indicating 70. Finally, they once again asked whether he had anything to tell them, and it proceeded to spell out Ollie, which happened to be Jenny's friend's younger brother's name. Her friend then explained that his younger brother, Ollie, had seen the spirit of an old man standing in the garden some years earlier. They ended their session with another prayer, and while I commend their attempts at making things safe, I hope the spirits that know way too much about them are leaving them alone. Number one, predicting a death. Heads up, this might be a little triggering for folks, so I promise I won't mind if you hop off now. Heck, the first time I read the story, I got tears in my eyes because it hit close to home for me. Allison was a teen at the time and was at a friend's house for a sleepover, when she and her friends decided to play with a Ouija board in the garage. Her friend's mother was at work and her father was in bed, so they had no supervision and decided some debauchery was in order. While playing with the board, they asked if anyone wanted to speak to them and got a yes, so they asked for a name. They got Mom. And when they asked for a message, it said, under bridge. No one understood the message at the time. Later, after they had gone to bed, there was a knock at the front door. It was the local sheriff who had come to the house to tell the girl's father that his wife had been car accident on her way home from work that night, and her car was found submerged in water under a bridge just a few miles from their home. While I don't believe it was actually the mom communicating over the board, I'm just hoping it wasn't a demon who actually caused harm. But yeah. I don't really have much more to say on this tale, other than I feel like I've had the wind knocked out of me. And that brings us to the end of our time, and I'm really hoping I convince someone out there to either burn the stupid board or just leave it at the store. On that note, if you ever find a board in a random place, just leave it. Trust me on the fact that you don't need that mojo in your life. I hope you all found my ramblings useful, and if you did, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hitting the bell for more horror content from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see you all next time, you lovely spooky people.